you know, this shelter in place thing has removed my ability to sit in the car and listen to music and get inspiration for this segment. Okay, let's think, I will sing this with Gusto. When a hero comes along. Oh my God. On. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> What's up? Oh, just another charming day in exactly the same damn spot. <laughs> you know, uh, I was watching a video of the two of us sitting next to each other at a table recording a curmudgeon recently, i.e. watching an old curmudgeon show episode. And I was like, wow, we interact more when we're in the same place. We're more natural and more fun to watch. And I, by that I mean less horrible. You know. I mean, I'm equally wooden no matter where I am. It's probably more a reference to you than to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. <clears throat> anyway, welcome to another episode of the Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason uh, Quarantine Camisa, and this is Derek Tam Shelter in Place Scott. Um, <laughs> that wasn't bad. I wasn't yeah. sure where you were going with that, but I, I, that worked I, out okay. Me neither. <laughs> it will surprise you to no extent at all to, uh, to know that I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm going to mm-hmm. make it bigger on my screen, though, so I can see what dirty looks you're giving me. Um, mm. While I do this, is that a yeah, fashion sorry. thing? Technical difficulties, people. Hmm? Is it a what? Fashion thing? Looks? Spelled L? Never mind. Okay. Uh, you were singing something about heroes? Yes. Tell us why. Because you came up with the idea that we should do an episode on hero cars. And should you, the question being, should you ever meet your heroes? Mm hmm. Have you prepared a list? I did. I prepared. I, I chicken scratched a list on notes for other things. Did you know, for example, so, so half of this page is <laughs> notes on meet your heroes and the other half, let me make sure there's nothing profane on this. Okay. So here are notes about... <laughs> oh, wait, when have you ever made a provision for trying to avoid profanity? You have no idea what I doodle when I'm on, when I'm on calls. So this is, did you know that in 1971, Porsche set the record at Le Mans for the fastest speed on the Le Mans, uh, the Balzan Strait? Balzan Strait? Yeah. At? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, oh, no. 237 miles an hour? No. No. In 1971? Are we talking about different years? Because you probably have this, like, hard drive spinning in the back of your head that you can go, <laughs> boop, 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 and spit it out. Uh, it was faster, wasn't it? No. Slower. It wasn't? No. Oh. Yeah, it was slower. So 1971. That would be the um, 917. That was a 917, did 225 miles an hour. Hmm. And then 1978, the 935 did 228, <laughs> three miles an hour faster. Really? Um, yeah. It's amazing because the 935 is kind of a 911 based car and the 917 is like a dedicated not. prototype. Yep. And then that record stood for a long time until 1988. Um, well, I think it fell in 87, but the, the, big, the big record, which still stands today, is a uh, Peugeot P88, which was a, um, uh, was a project done specifically to break the 400 kilometer an hour barrier. The car like, didn't, basically couldn't make it three laps without exploding. It had a turbocharged uh, PRV V6. Oh, it, no. But it has a record at 407 kilometers an hour, which is 253 miles an hour. And those of you who know modern cars should understand what that 253 mile an hour speed is. It's you know? the top speed of the Veyron. Yeah, and now you know why that was that car's top speed. Because, think about it this way. Ferdinand Piek is Ferdinand Porsche's grandson, and he was in charge of Porsche racing in 1971 when the 917 set that all-time speed record. Then he went on to Audi, in the process, by the way, opened up his own engineering company and made the five-cylinder Mercedes diesel that we all know and love. The, you know, the one that has the <laughs> lope. Anyway, he what, does that. It's, in, it's involuntary that we all know it because those things all refuse to die. Yes, exactly. There will be coronavirus <laughs> and Mercedes OM6, whatever that engine is. 603 or something like that. Six something. Um, anyway... But then, so he was at Audi, and then the, the, that, that, um, that other speed record was... This is all on a side, by the way. This has nothing to do with this episode. Yeah, we, weren't we going to do an episode all about Ferdinand Piech someday? Yeah, we need to. But this is like... I'm in the middle of doing this research for something else that should be coming out soon for me. But um, mm-hmm. more importantly, so he was... You know, then his namesake company, like 
yeah, it's his grandfather's company then set the uh, 935 record and then Peugeot blows through it, right? So think about it this way. When he goes to make the fastest car in the world, all he is is like, the, the target wasn't over 400. The target was 407 kilometers an hour, which was exactly the engineers that, on, that I talked to years ago were like, that was the target. It had to be as fast as the, the fastest Le Mans car ever, but be a road car. So anyway, mm -hmm. I just think that... Like, it's very know, Ferdinand Pierre. We'll talk more about his... Non-arbitrary. Yes, we'll talk more about his extraordinary uh, leadership yes. in some future episode because I think both of us want to do this episode, but we need to do some digging to yeah. make sure that we uh, can adequately do justice to the. Here's the problem: the I can't even figure out how to pronounce his name. P his family members all pronounce it differently. It's either Piek or Piech. You can't hmm. have pick one. Anyway, so um, so that that's what's on my sheet. Plus some interesting things about. Uh, S54 firing order because uh, Thomas from the Throttle House, which is Canadian pronunciation of house, uh, Throttle House just started to have a problem with his, M his S54 engine and his M3 and he called me at like 2 o'clock in the morning and it's like, I think I Are had you sure he, Is this what you were talking about last night? The 2 o'clock in the morning? No, no. Uh, it was another friend who was a heart palpitations up on my... An actual night. emergency. An actual heart palpitation, okay. as opposed so, to the throttle. So I, well, you said heart process. palpitations. I wasn't sure if, if heart palpitations meant an S54 problem. Oh, that would give me full on cardiac arrest and not just, uh, just palpitations. Those Does he want you airing out his dirty laundry about his S54 being no, sick? No, choice now. I didn't say what he did to it to cause it. I mean, 9,000 RPM oh, so he caused for it. hours on it. <gasps> did I say that? I'm totally kidding. Um, he did no, it's a, it's a BMW uh, motor. It can fail on its own without being mistreated. Yeah, it's an S54. You just start it and it'll have rod, rod bearing wear. Um, but anyway, I have a list of heroes. Heroes that came along and gave me the strength to carry on. Mariah Carey. Or uh, that just fucking ruined my image. And so I think... We, can, we have plenty to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I've had this experience where in the course of my career interacting with esoteric cars, I've met some hero cars. And uh, I'm sure that this is reductionist to say there's only two possible outcomes. Uh, but there are, I would say, at, there's two opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, sorry, I'm too close. Two opposite <laughs> ends of the spectrum, which, okay, now Jason's voguing. Um, I didn't even think about that. Look uh, around. Okay. <laughs> We're never going to get this episode started. Uh, why, what, what, hold on. What else do you have to do? You can't drive anywhere. You can't go anywhere. You can't talk to anyone. You, you know, we have masks orders now. I have, have not to exercised today, and so I'm going a little bit insane. Uh, we all have okay. to be nice. Everyone be, everyone be nice to Derek. He gets very angry. Um, he's like a, he's like a, you know, like shepherd or one of the busy dogs that have to like run around the yard and just get energy out. Anyway, yes. So two possible uh, two outcomes. Two possible too. outcomes. Uh, I, I would say disappointment or um, at the other end of the spectrum, appointment, um, which is, you know, I, I've had both happen. Uh, and sometimes you expect one outcome and you get the other. So it's, it's just been interesting to, I, would, I think it will be interesting to compare notes about what happens or what has happened for you when you've met some hero cars versus, you know, Sure. Some being stellar and others being like, what the hell is the fuss about? I think it's also important to acknowledge something that we talked about at the end of the last episode, which was that uh, if you experience a car in either a bad example of a car or you experience a car in an environment that's not optimized for that car's strengths, then it can, you can have a sort of, you can misread uh, the car Hero and status, you can say right? like, I just completely didn't experience this car in the way that it was intended. Like, I think that's true of E30 M3s. I've, I've only sort of just parted around an E30 M3. I've never driven one hard. Mm. Uh, and so everyone says like, oh, you have to beat the snot out of it and then it'll be good. But my experience kind of just pottering around in town with it was that it was pretty lame. Yeah. My first E30 M3 experience was, I hated it. I was driving on I-95 in South Florida sitting in traffic. And I'm like, this is buzzy. It's loud. It sounds like shit. It's slow as fuck. I hated it. Absolutely hated it and got right into a 325 afterwards and said, why would anyone buy this car? And then you drive it on track or, you know, in, in anger on a back road and it, then it makes sense. But 
Yeah, so I guess, I mean, that was my experience with the, the uh, E30 M3. I, I guess I should reserve judgment until I absolutely cane one. Uh, I think potentially another car that could be like that is the, the e BMW CSL. Um, I have what? So, yeah, good, it's on your list because it's on mine. So what was your read on the CSL? So I, this was this a, is like, by the way, the E9 CSL. This is E9. like early 70s. We, yep. we'll, yeah, we'll have a photo of this thing. This was a drive from Los Angeles to uh, Pebble Beach. And it was a BMW museum car that they shipped in. And they shipped them to, to LA and that had a bunch of journalists get in the car uh, and drive it. So I drove it halfway to, uh, uh, to Monterey. And so it was all back. Like we just took Ridge Roads the rest of the way, the whole way. And I could not get over how compliant and soft the car and how well behaved it was and how tractable, but what, an exper- what a great experience it was the whole time. I really liked it, but it was not what I expected. It wasn't like nuts um, yeah. and crazy. The fucked up thing is I was just talking about this with, with my buddy Bill Arnold who raced them for years and just a complete BMW expert. And he was like, what? The CSLs use thinner gauge metal. They actually were stamped in the same body panels, but every piece of metal was thinner. So they had so much chassis flex that the cars were terrible. And I'm like, they were? Like this one was soft and it was great. And he was like, yeah, they were fine until you put grippy tires on them. And then he would get like an air gap would open up in corners in his car from the chassis flexing so much that the doors would pull away from the body. (laughs) And I was like, was the car just rusted and rotten? He was like, no, 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 it's just how they were. They needed to be really I mean, light. they are very vulnerable to rust. Well, yeah. um, I would say my experience is consistent with yours. Like, I found the car to be very civilized and tractable. It, it, like, for all of the mental space and, like, the Batmobile image that the car has, like, the expectation was that it was going to be really visceral and fizzy and, like, an exciting sports car experience. And that was not my experience. I thought it was mm. quite sort of softly sprung and just yeah. generally civilized and kind of quiet. And I guess... My sort of reference point going into that car was a 73 Carrera RS, uh, which is an absolute just thrill blast, like really visceral, everything wonderful about 911s that everyone always parrots. Like I think that the 73 Carrera RS deserves all of it. And so that's one of those hero cars where when you, when I met it, I was like, that's amazing. And and it fully lives up to the reputation that the car (laughs) has. Uh, even if you're just pottering around in town, I mean, you, you, the car instantly feels special and it, you, it feels really light and responsive, like very low inertia, both of the like drivetrain and the mechanical systems and the way that it revs and also like its responsiveness to driver inputs. And the, by comparison, the E9, even in the CSL form, uh, admittedly, I was driving a city pack car, not, you know, the, the car with all the spoilers and stuff on it. Uh, but the CSL just felt really like sort of sleepy and subdued and grand tour y. Uh, Listen, you could say that about any, RS. if you take any generation, interestingly enough, any generation BMW and Porsche, the same thing happens. Like an E30 is a magic car to drive, but drive an SC or a Carrera 3 2 at the same time. Uh, you know, Porsches were just always one order of magnitude greater at sports cars than BMW uh, but were. BMW guys will fight you to the death of uh, look I'm a BMW guy too because I think to to what you've said in the past is they make magnificent single vehicle solutions right um, but you drive a 993 and an E36 M3 which are sort of of the same era and sorry but the 993 is a sports car and at the end of the day the E36 is based on a on a quote they used to call it near luxury sedan it was a much bigger heavier thing um so i'm actually not surprised to hear you say that about it about the e9 the csl because the csl was effectively a luxury sports gt that was turned into a race car whereas a 911 was kind of a race car turned into a luxury gt for some of the Mm. other models Mm -hmm. um that's interesting i just did not expect such a stark difference in personality from the same country and both cars which were sort of homologated for racing purposes you'd especially as the sort of hot limited production version i would have thought they end up a lot closer to each other than they did and i would say for for that today if you drove an m2 uh, competition back to back with a 718 gt4 or came in gt4 you would find the same level of difference like between incredibly visceral holy shit unbelievable pure driving experience in the cayman gt4 and I'm really the 981 is what I'm talking about. And then the M2, in by comparison, feels heavy and rubbery and fat and isolated and all these other things. But it wouldn't if you didn't drive the Porsche. But uh, when you have that, that Porsche as the yardstick, then... Kind of get uh, yeah, I mean, I th- another thing that I've experienced with some of these hero cars 
is that you have to have had enough uh, experiences in other cars of the same period, if it's an old car, to right. get why it's so special. Because you, like someone was approaching me, I was thinking about buying a vintage Ferrari, a vintage 12 cylinder Ferrari. Uh, and I said, how many other vintage cars have you driven? Because if you've only driven modern cars that are high performance, uh, and then you get into a vintage Ferrari, I think you'll be disappointed by the experience. Uh, All vintage Ferraris? Uh, I mean, I don't know. If it's a race car, then it's going to be really stimulating. Well, yeah. uh, but what I, immediately I, comes to mind is like a 330, which blew my mind in the totally wrong way. Like the, not the wrong way, the, the way I did not expect it to. So the, the only 330 I drove was GTS. Yes. Rosso Rubino, it was mm-hmm. absolutely his friend's car. I couldn't get over how civilized it was and how like the engine didn't wasn't loud, but the complexity of the noise and didn't scream, but the tenor of the noise, all of these different things worked together to make this like one of the best 60s car I'd ever driven in terms of just being a good, comfortable cruiser. No, mm. I expected it to be maniacal and nuts. Oh, um, no, 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 not at all. Right. Uh, but but if, you, if you hustle them, they're surprisingly willing and competent also. And that's the thing about that car. It has a sort of well-roundedness to it that is really nice. And people, of course, gravitate towards other cars that, from the same era, like the 275, which is, I think, a more traditionally beautiful car. Uh, it's more exotic looking. Uh, and uh, the 250 is like the Lusso, for example. Uh, but the 330 GTC remains persistently like the one that all the people go to who uh, sort of have owned them all and who like to drive them because the car is so well-rounded, because it is, it's actually genuinely fast. Like most 250s are kind of slow and it's, it's a four-speed gearbox and it's not a transaxle and, uh, you know, they're rated at like 240 horsepower. These things have like the 330s have, I think it's 320 horsepower and the 365, which is the same car essentially has like another, I don't know what it's, 20 horsepower. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a genuinely fast car in a way that the early cars are not. And also you get independent rear suspension, which makes a huge difference in terms of like the, uh, the ability of, to, of the car to keep the rear wheels on the ground more of the time, which, you know, helps with road holding and also they're much more comfortable. So too. wouldn't that, I mean, is this a hero hit or miss for you though? I mean, this, I mean, me, I think the 330 hit. GTC is such a like sort of visually, it doesn't rise to the same place in people's minds as California's or 250 Lusos or 275's that it's not it's not almost not a hero car it's kind of this random esoteric car Mm. because it gets aesthetically overshadowed in so many of I mean because these cars are pretty rare and a lot of people don't interact with them they don't have a chance to like even pedestalize the GTC's Uh, but everybody who's owned a lot of these cars or driven a lot of them like the GTC's kind of the one you want because it's the best to drive but yeah, so I would so so I would say the car that's not the here the two fifty like, it's a cool experience. But the other ones that are later and less expensive are uh, better cars to drive by a surprisingly large magnitude for being you know only five years newer. Hmm. Interesting, cool. I have no uh, experience in two fifties. It's uh, I don't know. If you've driven a three thirty GTS, it's kind of that's the the kind of the epitome of the vintage Ferrari experience in my mm-hmm. opinion. That was that was a Ferrari that really hit the mark. I don't that wasn't a hero car for me. I was never into sixties Ferraris, but um, I sort of lumped them all together, and I'm like, okay, this is a vintage Ferrari. It's a gen- it looks like a gentleman's sports car. It does not look like you know anything outrageous, um, but could not get over just how inherently good the clutch was. Light the take up was light. You know, the clutch take up was perfect. The engine responded beautifully everywhere. A thousand RPM, six thousand RPM didn't mm-hmm. care. The shifter was great. The seats were comfortable and soft. It was softly sprung. Like just, but it still feels special, and if yeah. you hustle it, it's rewarding. It doesn't fall apart if you start to dr- drive it too fast, which is what yeah. happens with a lot of vintage cars. Yep. Cool. Uh, well, so, what about more contemporary Ferraris? I know you have thoughts on this topic. The biggest heart... It's not the biggest heartbreak of them all, because I have that reserved for something else. The, my biggest letdown was Ferrari 308. Mm. So... Mm-hmm. I should say that at some point in my 30, like I think I was when I turned 30, I'm like, I'm going to buy me a sports car. Um, And I had driven an F430 and liked it um, ish. I mean, there's no way I could afford it. Um, But I had, you know, it also um, driven a 360 and I didn't love it. 
So I thought, let me just go out and start looking for a Ferrari. And I went through a bunch of them, didn't like them, 355. I just couldn't love, love it. And then I did it again when I turned 40, which is now years ago already. And I went through and drove a 308, a 328, skipped 348, a 355, and a 360. And I just, I, I, I know I'm going to get so much shit for this. I hated them all. Hated them all. Um, but the, you know, the... Let's be more specific. What did you hate about them? Going backwards, the 360 um, did not handle all that well. It understeered terribly. It had no grip. And this could have been, again, to your point, the car that I drove. Um, it just wasn't... Yeah, tires, alignment, setting. Great. For even a 430 manual, they don't really, they don't have a lot of grip. Um, they're, they have a really light flywheel, which is something that you can get used to, but it, you really have to work very hard at, which I kind it's of... It's not an intuitive shifting right. experience. But the 430 didn't sound great. The 360 doesn't sound good at all. Inside the car, outside, they sound great. And then, then you get down to 355. 355s, I, can, I, love, or I think it's the best sounding for V8 of all time. Outside the car, um, I don't think they sound particularly good inside. The rubbery, sticky plastics, I didn't love. And then when you get down to the rest of the driving experience, the steering is okay. The power is good. The brakes are okay. The interior is all right. And the whole car across the board was, was fine. But fine isn't going to cut it for me for, you know, my life, my life savings, basically. So then I went down to, you know, I skipped 348 because everyone says it sucked, which might be a mistake. But then 328 and 308, oh my God, they are so bad. They, the driving position is wretched. And I don't I agree with that. that. Like and that. I'm not a big guy. And so normally I like people make comments about driving position and I'm like, I didn't notice that because I'm 5'10", which is like sort of an, a height that is, I would say, about the upper limit for most Italian cars. ergonomically confined yeah. cars where mm-hmm. you're like, okay, if you're 5'10 or under, it's okay. It's not even so much the room. There, you know, it's, it's no, you're, way... you're sort of laid back. The steering wheel's at a funny angle. Like somehow the steering wheel's also in the way of your legs, even if you're right. not that tall. Like it's just the whole package of the nothing interior. Li- nothing lines up. And I don't necessarily mind that much, especially in that era of cars, an offset steering wheel or a slightly offset driving position. But everything is so cattywampus in that car that you're, nothing winds up being linear because of it. Like you can't get a good grip on the steering wheel First, you're, the pedals are over there. The shifter's here. I mean, everything's just kind of all over the place. And you wind up never getting comfortable driving the car. And then you can't see anything in any direction. Um, you're uncomfortable. The, the gears are so long and the car is so fucking slow. And the only 308s I've driven are Quattro Valvoles. So the four valve per cylinder. Yes. They are Late dog injected slow. Cars. They sound like They sound like nothing. And the, the engine has this sort of inertness to it, which I've noticed in all CIS Ferraris. Yeah. Like really? it just it doesn't it's a CIS thing. Well, like the, so, the, mm, you know, the five twelve TR is not like this actually, but the the Testarossa is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the motor, the inje- early injected Ferraris they just especially if you compare to what came before, which is four Webers right. or right. you know, yeah, four Webers regardless of whether it was a car, uh, twelve or eight cylinder. Personality less. Uh, the motor no is I think is very much devoid of of personality. Yeah. Uh, that was in such a horrible, and I think in terms of power delivery, power delivery, hundred percent. Yeah, it was just such a, a heartbreak because that three hundred eight is totally not my kind of car. But I helped a friend detail one, and I spent two days staring at it and touching every little thing, a piece of it. And the more I touched it, and the more I looked at it, the more I fucking completely fell in love with this car. And then I drove it back to the owner's house, and on the way, I was like heartbroken. Like, I can't have yeah. one of these. I will never have one. You can't have a car that looks up here and drives down that. I, I just can't do that. Um, what a total heartbreak. Yeah. Uh, but interestingly, your 308 GT4 has a very different feeling to it. Uh, yeah. And well, that, I mean, that car's not a hero car because everyone hates it because it's ugly and it's funny looking and it's four seats and it it's proportionally it, challenged and all it that. It wasn't even a hero car for me because I didn't know anything about it. Like, you know, you yeah. pulled up in it at my house and I'm like, what the fuck did you buy an ugly white... What is that? <laughs> like, that was my reaction. Like, what? What? Ew. Um, and then I drove it. And that, that is now, is quickly ascended through the ranks of my favorite cars I've ever owned. Um, yeah. And because of the And it. the driving experience of that, so, you know, a 308, like a sort of entry level injected 308 GTS from, say, 1981 is the most accessible Ferrari you can buy other than a Mondial. Interestingly, Mondials, I think, work better than 308s. Like, if you drive a Mondial, you'll have a better experience. Uh, than a 308. 
Uh, that's probably a controversial perspective, but... I don't uh, doubt it. Given, given the difference between a 308... So the only Mondial I've ever been is Mondial T, which is a 348, effectively. Yes. But the, um, given the difference between a 308 GT4, which is magnificent to drive, and a 308 GTB GTS, which is terrible to drive, I'm not surprised you say that about the Mondial. Yeah. So actually, that's like a sort of a sleeper. Collect. People always ask, like, what should I buy? And it depends on, like, I don't think it's a good investment. But if you want something that drives better, then I would certainly buy a Mondial over a 308, which is a controversial perspective because the I, 308 has always overshadowed. I want, a uh, three, I want to look at a 328 or a 308. I want, you know, yeah, I even want to look at a 348, but I can't. I just can't do it. Yeah. I can't if, if a 348 drives anything like that. But, so that's a big, that's, that was one of the biggest letdowns was... I mm-hmm. was finally in a position where I thought I could spend. At the time, the 328 I was looking at was 40,000 bucks. And mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, I can stretch and I can do this and this will be great. And it was blue with tan and it was gorgeous. I've mentioned it before on this podcast. I couldn't. I just couldn't. Yeah. Uh, but the GT4, by contrast, is a pleasure to drive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it drives much more similarly to a 246 uh, Ferrari than it does to a uh, 246 Dino. Uh, which, you know, there's $300,000 now, uh, than it does to a 308, uh, which is surprising. But they, they, they have a very it shouldn't similar... shouldn't be surprising they're the same car. I mean, uh, the, the, yes. the, 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 Dino, the 246 Dino became a 308 GT4 and in the process got a wheelbase and a track stretch. But it was mm-hmm. the same basic suspension design and all it did was get a V8 instead of a 6. Um, yes. So if you were to drive a 246, having right. owned a 308 GT4, I think you'll find that it's much more, the, the gap between a 246 and a 308 GT4 is much smaller than the gap between a 308 GT4 and a GTB. Yeah. Anyway, we've gone down a Ferrari rabbit hole. Yep. Um, What's your biggest heartbreak ever? <sighs> Let's consult the list. You know, I have gone into this, oh, yes. Actually, it's a pretty decisive answer. I was starting to waffle or sandbag, but I actually have a very clear answer to that question. Biggest heartbreak ever was a 959. Ooh. Um, I'm not surprised. I was born in the late 80s. I grew up in the era of like, I mean, I think we had a lot of old like car magazines and books around the house. And so the 959 to me, even though I was born at the time when it was being sold new, I also started doing car stuff at like as a toddler. So anyway, the, the, that car, because it was forbidden fruit and because it was just the numbers are so incredible and the, perfor- the performance figures and the top speed and the sophistication like electronically, it was truly futuristic. Uh, and so this car had this huge sort of presence in my mind, especially because you couldn't see them here. And so if you could, never even saw one here, even if you went to Monterey Car Week as a child, like it just added all, you know, all this additional sort of appeal to the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the first time I drove one, I was, I don't know, some probably in my early 20s, I would guess. Uh, and uh, I, I had all these expectations and I thought it was going to be this really transcendent experience and it just wasn't. Uh, and, you know, now that I think about like what the car is, of course, it makes sense. And I've said this before. And I think you've said it, too, which is that that car was the vision, their vision, Porsche's vision for the future. Uh, when it came out yeah. uh, and it you know the, everything that they decided that they would try out ended up catching on and so now that you you drive like a 993 twin turbo and the, the 959 feels very similarly and speaking of which i don't think the 9, 993 twin turbo is a very good driving experience either that's also a disappointing car for me i have on uh, my list dis- on disappointment 911 turbo yes because every single one of them has been terrible yes. but i i think i might almost prefer mm, I don't know. The, 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 the massive turbo lag of the original turbo, the 930, gives it this sort of texture that is at least interesting. It's very, very turbocharged. Uh, and the 959 like, does away with that. It just it felt like ha- having driven a lot of 911s up to that point, it just felt like another 911 to me. Uh, and that was really disappointing because I thought it was going to be this really extraordinary, like what, what, it, what it really came down to was the car was not visceral enough. It was right. too quiet. It was too civilized. It felt too familiar. It just felt like, why do you spend a million dollars for this experience, which you could get, you know, if you bought a stock, uh, if you bought a, a, a 964 Carrera 4, this is, you know, oh, wait, for this is the, this $45,000. The but it's the same mistake Porsche continues to make right today, today with the 992, turning it into a 928. Porsche is magnetically attracted to the idea of a 928 and just can't fucking stop. They just can't pull themselves away from becoming old men machine. 
and the 959 was an old man machine. Well, I want to go fast, but I don't want to do a lot of work. I want to keep it in gear, let the turbos do it and whatever. They just keep going back. Well, and do this, this really safely with four wheel drive right. and have all these electronics that because like, I mean, it's all the things that make today's cars sort of like disappointing, which yeah. is this sort of like intermediation between you and the driving experience. Mm -hmm. And you compare it to say like an F40, which was like performance wise, quite similar. But there's all of this sort of theater associated with an F40 and this visceralness. I mean, the thing's Kevlar and the seats are fabric and it's all these like terrible rattles and noises. Like it's just really st like a stimulating, visceral, overwhelming experience. And the 959 is so civilized that it's right. uh, boring. It's, it's a little bit dull. And that was boring. like a little bit crushing for me. But also, I don't know, kind of reassuring because... Like, I, I don't want to be one of those blind Porsche fanboys. Like, I recently tabulated the cars I've owned, and over 50% of them were Porsches, which I was... I mean, in, to be fair, like, about 10 of them were done as, as flips. Oh, uh, but in, in any case, like, I, I, people accuse me of being a Porsche fanboy, um, but the, the, my reaction and experience to the 959 was... Uh, Finally, you don't like one. <laughs> That's my reaction. Well, I mean, there's a lot of them that I, I, I don't like. Uh, I didn't like the Carrera GT, actually, until I drove one, and then I got it more. I still yeah. don't think I would own one, but it I don't think felt... it's fair to judge any car until you've driven one. Correct. Uh, but a lot of people do, because, you know, a lot of these cars are hard to come by. But mm -hmm. uh, the Carrera GT I liked better after having dri driven it, which is a nice experience to have, as opposed to the opposite experience, which I had with the 959, which I liked it quite a lot less after I drove one. Uh, but yes, Porsche turbos in general, like I think I've recounted what happened when I, I bought a Porsche turbo because, you know, it was a childhood dream and then I, it just ended up being such a compromised car from a driving perspective that I uh, sold it after putting 500 miles on it in 18 months or something like that. Right. Uh, and so, yes, I agree, Porsche turbos, be because the thing that makes Porsche as great is this sort of, like, I, I use the word effervescence. Uh, this sort of like lively character that is so engaging and involving and is everything that makes a 73 Carrera RS or frankly, I think anything that has ever had a Porsche RS badge on it uh, has this sort of character to it that is really about not filtering information from the driver. And turbos have always been about filtering Filter, information. Yeah. It's always yeah. been about making it as effortless and uh, civilized and easy to go fast. Uh, and that's not the point of a car for for me personally. And I think most... And look, from an engineering enthusiast. perspective, I said 911 turbos are wretched. From an engineering perspective, they're not. They're better cars in a lot yes. of ways. If But they're, they're less good Porsches. And yes. there has never been any turbocharged Porsche that I would take over the naturally aspirated... Uh, variant. So you gave if you gave me a 997 turbo or nine, you know, any any generation 911 turbo, I would give it back to you and say, please give me the NA version. I would. Uh, what slower. about like GT2s? Never driven rear GT2. wheel drive turbocharged car. I've never driven a GT2, but I can tell you right off the bat, I don't like the way that engine sounds. I mean, yes. it, it revs to 6400 instead of 8000 uh, on the contemporary GT3s or 9000 now. Um, I like mm -hmm. revs. I like visceral, uh, you know, noises. Um, mm -hmm. I like induction noise. I like instant response. And I can, with, I've driven 911 turbos, so I know what that engine is and what it's capable of doing. And I don't like it at all. I don't like the way it sounds. I don't like the way it responds. I don't like anything about it. Um, when compared, so, you know, they're, they're amazing. When compared to the naturally aspirated engines, especially the GT engines, like the GT3 engine. No contest. Mm -hmm. I don't need to drive a GT2. To, to, I can plug the pieces in. I'm sure it's magnificent around a track. I don't give a fuck. I'm not Walter Rural. I'm not Randy Popes. Doesn't matter. I don't need the fastest car out there because I'll set you know my own personal lap time and whatever, whatever I'm driving doesn't doesn't need to be something fast. Mm -hmm. Were there any other Porsches on your list? Nine Eleven Turbo All um, <laughs> was on the disappointment list. No. What about no the other. appointment list? No, no Porsches on on the appointment list. I think you should uh, drive some air-cooled RS cars if you have. You have. You? I would love to. You know what? Actually, hold on. There was one. Another. There was another disappointment. Disappointed car, and I don't. It's not on my. There it is. Singer. Mm. Yeah. And he, here's. I, I I adore those singers. I love the way they look. I take away nothing about from their craftsmanship. 
the way they're constructed, the way they're put together, they are rolling pieces of art. Um, I drove the four liter car right uh, after I had driven every generation of 911 on snow tires at Weissach, at Porsche's Proving Grounds. Um, and those cars on winter tires were, it was the biggest stupid slideways, stupid fest I'd ever done in my life. Never had so much fun at a manufacturer press event at all. Um, and then I got in the Singer and the Singer was just so anesthetized by comparison. It was so good. It was so long geared, buttoned down, really modern, you know, competent, modern, competent, drama free. I would have rather had a 65 short wheelbase early 911 car and had it be all over the place and scare the shit out of me and just slow. I mean, the Singer is a modern car. It behaves like a modern car. Right. Uh, but it looks like an old car. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's some appeal to that. I have driven one and not very hard, but I, my, my overarching impression of the car is very similar to yours, which is that mm. at, so the, it's based on a 964 Carrera 2. So I had at the same time a hot rodded Carrera 2, which was basically now that I've driven an RS 964, like there, it's basically the same driving experience of my car I had as the 964 RS. And the difference between that and a Singer was really surprising. The Singer was just, it felt really kind of like civilized and modern. It just, it just didn't have any of the texture that I was seeking from the car or expecting from the car as an air-cooled 911. And so I agree, I would much rather have a, a vintage you know, 911 from the first half of the 70s or earlier. I mean, even like a well set up 3.2 or a 964 RS would be more interesting to me, you know, because a 964 RS is, I don't know. All right, Porsche price. fanboy, enough. I can't hear Okay, anybody. right, next topic. Uh, <laughs> did we close out BMW? I think there's a BMW on both of our lists that is uh, in the, the hero category, the, the do meet your heroes category. I have uh, one on each. Um, so the one for me that is overwhelmingly impressive was the, the 328. Yes. That'll be the pre-war BMW yes. 328. Wow. Um, that car... Wow. I mean, pre-war cars in general kind of suck to drive, generally. Yeah. Like, you will be delighted if you have brakes. Um, and there's a if. sort of just... Not how much if at all. Yes. Yep. Uh, and there's just this sort of like... I like them, but it's not something I'd ever want to drive hard or for a long period of time. You like it because it's like, wow, this is a novel experience. I'm operating a piece of equipment that requires a lot of like finesse and technique and attention mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, the 328 felt so modern in comparison to most other pre-war cars. I, I got so confused. I was so confused. A friend of mine was in the passenger seat we were rescuing. I, again, I've talked, we've talked about this. Rescuing cars from the Sonoma fires and just hopped in and drove it. And uh, he's like, what year is this? And I'm like... I thought it was a 39, but this thing looks like a, it drives like a 60s car. Like it just didn't compute. It was a 39, but I genuinely yeah. thought it was a car. Other than a couple little touches, it could have been a 60s car. It was 20, 30 years ahead of everything else. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, it, I mean, I think it compares favorably to like a Jaguar XK120, which was itself a very sophisticated car mm -hmm. when it came out in the early post-war years. Uh, so I would say the 328 is a genuinely usable pre-war car. And by, by modern people who aren't particularly skilled, such as myself. And you just got to be small. You just have to be real. The, the, the car is tiny. The interior is tiny. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, but generally, like a, a really impressively usable car. Uh, Easily the best standard. driving pre-war pre -war car I've ever. And nothing's, nothing's come close. Uh, Nothing. The SS100 is quite nice to drive also. The Jag SS100. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it doesn't have the same suspension sophistication in terms of like a lot of pre-war cars you drive over a bump and like everything is shaking and you're like, wow, it really feels like this car is made of wood, like because the bodies often were made of wood. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I would say I, I, that is, yeah, probably the best pre-war car that I have ever driven. What the BMW that's on my, my ruined list is the E31 850. And I got to say mm. it is an 850i automatic is a is a car that will crush your dreams because it looks so incredible and it drives so just i mean i would expect it to drive like a seven series it does 
like it an does, E32. But, but that was the first electronic throttle, and it just the transmission and the throttle didn't work together, and they ignored your request and whatever. 850i manual is much better, and by all accounts, an 850 CSI is actually wonderful, but I have not yet. I don't think I've ever driven an 8 series of any variety. Drive a manual. Yeah, I mean, um, that's kind of my philosophy generally. <laughs> let's move to Japanese for a quick second, quick second ah. because I have two camps. I have the, the Meet Your Hero stuff that went really well, and there's a lot of 60s Japanese stuff in there. Uh, 240Z, um, a Fair Lady Z432, a Toyota 2000 GT, mm-hmm. Honda S600, Honda S800, um, and then, the, oh, Mazda Cosmo. All of those cars were magnificent to drive in some way or another. Um, and the Hakoska, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Ha- Hakoska's on there too. Um, GTR. GTR. Um, yeah, that's, that's the... Oh, and then Datsun 2000 Roadster. I knew there was one more that I was forgetting. All of those cars just were just wonderful to drive. And I yes. thought, well, why is this era of Japanese cars so underappreciated? When, because they were the new kids on the black block and they were trying to make a good impression. Yeah, but oh, we've had 50 years, 60 years to figure this out. And you go back and you realize that every one of these cars was great. How yeah. have they not risen above you know, the, all the other cars that we drove? The 2000 GT the, is really a wonderful car oh, to drive also. Wow. And the, the, yeah. the Z cars and the S20 motored cars, I, mm-hmm. I agree. I've never driven a Cosmo. I've never driven... Uh, what else did you say? Think, Cosmo, yeah. think think 1960s RX-7 is exactly what you... Light, neutral handling, great steering. I mean, steering with uh, this much plane. I've never it. driven an RX-7. Oh, okay. Just, they're just like... Think Miata with better weight mm. distribution. Um, what was on, else was on the list? 2000 Roadster was just charming um, mm-hmm. and just inherently good. Randy Pope's um, told me they were wonderful. They I think are. he owned they one, are. and I think he may have raced it. He said he's had nothing but praise for the the two thousand. He said mm-hmm. that I had to try one out, so it's yeah, very much on my wonderful. list. That was on my Japanese and I liked the Z car that I owned very much, and I mean like S twenty. The one thing that really surprised me about the Hakosko, the steering weight. It had incredibly heavy steering, heavy steering. that was was not in not consistent with my expectations based on the width of the tires. Uh, nor the weight of the rest of the controls. Was this, a, this is GTR? Yes. What wheels and tires did it have? Were they stock? Uh, I will have to look at the pictures, but I think so. So the one that I drove is, is a friend of mine. Was it on what? Um, I don't remember what, what wheels they are, but they are, the car's lowered and it's on very, it's on wider tires and wider wheels in factory. Probably Watanabe. And I had uh, blisters after doing a day of filming. Okay, so your, your experience was similar to mine, yeah. really heavy steering. But it was modified, so- and I was told they're not that way, but it's stock. So they could the be The one heavy. I drove was pretty stock. Okay, yeah. Uh, but that was, it felt like it was, the, the steering was disproportionately heavy for the inputs of the, this is what in airplane speak is called control harmony, mm-hmm. which is that do, do all of the control inputs match in sort of weight and texture and feel and forces you need. Uh, which applies very much in cars too. And that yeah, car was a car that Porsche struck Masters, me as, yeah. as having not very good control harmony because mm-hmm. the steering was so much heavier than like, the else. throttle or the shifter, for mm-hmm. example. Yep. Uh, and like vintage Lamborghinis are kind of bad at this sometimes oh, yeah. also. Oh, yeah. uh, at, kind of bad at control harmony. Uh, Mura is on, is on a list, uh, is on one of my lists too. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I don't Guess which know. one. Guess which list. I'm genuinely unsure. Uh, it could really go both ways. It can. That, that car is so compromised from a driving perspective. I, like, it took me months to get sort of to the point where I don't have to actively be thinking about the things that I'm doing when I drive the Miura. Uh, there's a lot of stuff where, like, you pointed this out when you drove it, where I was like, oh, oh yes, that's actually all true. All of those things that are sort of compromised about it. Like I had sort of just filed away and were running as background processes of like, oh, these are this is part of driving the Miura. But there's a lot of stuff that objectively you're like, what the hell? Like the, the, <laughs> the, the way the steering wheel is angled is such that you cannot keep your hand on the steering wheel uh, mm-hmm. when if you, you are turning it because it's the top of the steering wheel is too far away and your arm's too short to reach the top of the steering wheel at the top. And so you have to shuffle steer the car. Uh, and that is inherent in the driving position, which is kind of reclined and your the pedals feel like they're the same distance away from you as the steering wheel. So you, the pedals feel like they're really like all up in your business and much too close. 
and the steering wheel is much too far away far so, away. to the point that you can't reach the top of it with but it's your also hand. D- too far away at different points it's too far at the top and it's okay at the bottom and it's bus- halfway it's in between like the okay sides. yeah at yeah. the at the nine and three yeah. positions so like the the position of the steering wheel and the, just the general driving position and ergonomics of like operating the controls in that car is weird and like the shifter you have to be very deliberate with because the leakage question. is quite Does convoluted. It, which column is it in? Is it a major uh, hero car for in me, a good way or not? The the net experience of that car is so spectacular and overwhelming and visceral and thrilling uh, that it is that it it is compelling. Uh, but I don't know that I would go so far as to say that it's good. Uh, it's not good, but it's firmly in my you want to meet this hero category because if Lamborghini has one target, that target is to be overwhelming in, to all of your senses. And that car is nothing but overwhelming to all of your senses. It's yes. not particularly good. I mean, it's fast and it sounds good and it, you know, it has, does some things well, but overall it's so sensory overload um, that you can't help but think this is a great experience even if the pain is an emotion too. Let's <laughs> be honest. I mean, yes. yeah. So it's it firmly is, in you want to drive one don't expect it to with be a good character. Car. Yeah. And I, I will say that, I mean, you pointed out that you were really overwhelmed with just all of the like things that you have to do to accommodate yeah. yourself to the car. And like, I, I do, I think I do this without thinking because I drive a lot of different old cars and in the course of doing that, I'm sort of just like, oh, this is the way it is. Now I have to behave in this way to operate this car. And so I don't think about like how things should be because like so few old cars are actually like the controls are where they should be. And so instead you just adopt, adapt yourself to whatever the car makes you do. And I'm like, have spent enough time driving the car now where I don't like most of those processes now, like I said, run as background processes. But when you sort of verbalize them all, I was like, oh, this is why I was so uncomfortable in the car for such a large portion of my early period driving it is because there's so many like sort of abnormal things that you have to ac- accommodate to and even if you don't realize consciously that you're doing it you're that takes mental processing power to sort of remember that like the for some reason the the brake pedal action and the relationship between the brake pedal and the throttle is is like very very abnormal right. uh, and and it's a perfect transition to the car that crushed me more than any other yes um, your turn be- on this front because this is an example of a car that got it all right, then it's all wrong. I know first, what it is. You know what it is? What is I it? think I know what it is. I think it's going to be the first gen uh, NSX. Yeah. I yeah. showed up with a cashier's check to buy one and bought a ticket, a plane ticket home instead of driving it home. It is, this is one of those that the magazines just got wrong. And here's, I'm going to give a little speech about the way the magazine world works. <clears throat> I think it's a a phenomenon that exists more now than it ever did, but a large portion of the people who work for primary automotive media don't own cars. Never have, never owned anything, they don't work on cars, they don't repair cars, they don't live with cars ever on a daily basis that they would have to buy with their own money. Um, And the net result of that is the, the magazine industry has forced a homogeny to all cars in this, in this weird, strange insistence that all things should do everything well. Well, you um, get an echo chamber in essence. Well, it's not even just that. It's that when you don't own five cars, for example, or you've never owned one car, right? How would you understand that you want a car to be bad at certain things? Like, it just doesn't make sense, logically. Give me the most compelling example of why a car should be bad at something. I mean, obviously because I agree it, with you because I drive old cars, but- to, Right, but, because but, if it's good at everything, it's not a good experience. It's boring. And the, and the first gen Acura NSX is one of the most boring cars I've ever driven in my life. The gears are at, stupidly, like 75, 80 mile an hour second gear is, or I think it, it may be even higher than that. Gutless, boring as shit. You gotta keep the revs up in traffic and then you're listening, or in, you know, when you live in a hill, it's a place with hills, and then you're listening to V6 mechanical noises? No, 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 nobody wants that, right? Living with the car, the, the, the front end scrapes everywhere. And I mean like just driving down the street. <laughs> the steering is completely dead on center. You have no sense of what's going on and it's unassisted, so there's no excuse for this. Um, the turning radius is massive, but, but 
oh, you get in and the shifter and the clutch work, this, you know, the control weighting is absolutely perfect Honda. And you get it in the, in the car and it goes, da 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 Da, 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 like every other Honda and the starter sounds like every other Honda and the climate controls work and the radio works and the wipers work. So for someone who's looking at this as a car and evaluating this as an automotive media person who's never owned a car before, yeah, it's a really good car compared to things like the Ferraris of the time that were deeply flawed and, and didn't do, the wipers hmm. didn't work well. Okay, and, would you rather, would you rather own an NSX or an F355? 355. Without question, without question, because at least the the three sixty five is flawed in in things that I don't like. It's it doesn't have the things that I do want in a lot of ways, and does have a lot of things I don't. But at least it's got some character. Like at least it has some personality. That NSX is just a heartbreak, such a heart. I wanted to love that car so badly. And by the way, the the next, the current one, oh my god! Like they listened to what the media said about the first one. And, and they got it all even more wrong. That's like totally the wrong, all of the wrong compromises. Um, I just, I, I need to drive a 3.2, uh, ad- admittedly, I need to drive a 3.2 because I've only dri- driven the three liter with a five speed instead of the 3.2 with a six, which apparently has shorter gear ratios and a lot more mid-range torque and whatever. And then it got power steering later on and they made the steering better and blah, 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 blah. But I've only driven the early cars and they are soul crushers. Soul crushers. And I understand why the media said they were great. It's the same reason why the media is currently pushing every car company to make turbocharged everything that does 0 to 60 in two seconds. Um, Hmm. It's because it's a 25-year-old kid who's never been in a fast car before. They don't realize fast fades. You have to have an experience. The experience is going to last forever. Um, And you put, you know, someone who's never been around cars or own cars and understand that over time you learn these nuances about the car and that's what makes it amazing and they go on a press launch and put 38 miles on some insanely fast car and they're like this is amazing or something like an aston martin and they're like it's not good enough um because they have no idea because just because it's not as fast as the ferrari was or just because of this you know some zero to 60 stat or something else i mean it is the logical extension of people sitting at home reading magazines and being like i want this one because it's two tenths of a second faster yeah exactly exactly uh, uh, and I, this, so much of this experience is about sort of the coherent result of things. And it's, I don't know, it's kind of like dating people or like you come across per, a person where they're, they're like a, a prospective mate. And it's like, e- despite the fact that like every box seems to be ticked, the, the result is that the, it's not compelling potentially. Like go, this, on, go on match.com and go and look at the people who they give you a 98% match with and tell me that that's going to work. <laughs> Unless Match.com just has me totally wrong. Um, I did this years and years and years ago. But they're like, patented algorithm that, that automatically detects the first person that it showed. I was like, oh, okay, goodbye. Forget about it. Yeah, me. but a lot of it also, you just show up and you, you, you interact with someone. And sometimes you're like, I don't find, like, we're not well matched. And I don't find this person attractive. But for some reason, like, I feel this really strong, visceral, like, Here's connection. Because you can't dilute something that is an emotional thing, like a car, down to a bunch of stats. It just doesn't work yes. that way. It doesn't yes. work that way. Um, so that's why, for example, I have another whole section here in the middle of cars that can go either way. One of them is an Aston Martin V8 Vantage. So the original 4.3 was a total disappointment to me. I was devastated that it, it looked a 10 out of 10 in the way it looks, and then it drove like a six. And then over the years, they went to the 4.7 and they did a bunch of other updates to it, and it became better than I had ever even hoped. And then the, the V12S came out and lo- I lost my mind over that. So that was a car that both crushed me and then lived up to its, um, its potential, as did the Alpha 105 cars, the GTV. Hmm. Yes. Um, they, they, well, they did a lot of changes over the course of the production from that car. And they did it in the wrong way. Yes. The 2000 is the first one I drove. Didn't love it. And then I drove a 1600 liked it a lot and then I drove a 1750 and I'm like this is the sweet spot so 2000 didn't live up to the standards um, that I my expectations didn't live up to hero status but the 1600 and 1750 which were earlier did yes what did you prefer about the 1750 over the 1600 so the 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 uh, what I prefer about the 1750 just a little more power Mm -hmm. Um, the 1600 was the best I think of of them all I like the 1750s interior better um 
but the 1600 was everything that car was supposed to be. But, you know, it revved to 6,500. It made all the most glorious noises. It did all the right things. And then you get to the 2000s, they only revved to 5,400, 5,200. They don't rev. They're just Lower compression all... ratio, more mild cam timing, which is all emission stuff. It also has the Spica right. injection, which the 1750s also have. The 1600s right. are carbureted. Right. Uh, um, but the say... 1750s at least revved. Well, a hotted really up as 2000, a hotted mm-hmm. up 2000. It's not no, now. They're no longer smog required uh, with Weber's on it and like a, would... more aggressive cams and a higher compression ratio. Those are every bit as spicy, uh, or like sort of exciting. Maybe, you know, obviously maybe more so than a 1600. Uh, but what I find unforgivable about the late car, not unforgivable, that's too hard, but what I prefer about the early cars is there's a sort of plasticiness to the interior mm-hmm. of the later cars and some of the detailing of the exterior also that is just quite a bit less compelling. Uh, yeah, the early so cars were special, more special on the inside. Yeah, there's just this wonderful sort of 1960s too. feel to the mm-hmm. early cars, which got replaced by the sort of 70s plasticiness, uh, yeah. which is, you know, disappointing. Uh, but you know, this is comparing them to each other. Like then if you compare it to like, I don't know, a 84 spider, then I think they're all more compelling all great, than yeah. that. But it's just, uh, th- that was on the list of, I had three different cars that could go either way. You know, like you yes. can't just say a one, alpha one. And so theoretically you could get into a 3.2 liter NSX and be like, oh my God, it's completely transformed. Just like the, I it happened absolutely with, could. A, with a V8 Vantage. I kind of doubt it, but I absolutely could. The other one was I drove within, in the same month, two 1967 Ford GT500s. Hmm. Um, one was the one that appeared in the Icons video, which is a twin Paxton supercharged manual. And the other one was a, was a Haggerty's uh, display car that was a three-speed automatic. And that automatic ruined. That, that car was so just unimpressive. And so like, wow, this legend was like, and I drove that one first. Like, wow, it's a GT500, it's a monster, it's whatever. And I drove it, and I'm like, you know, it's terrible in all the right, like 1960s muscle car ways with steering that doesn't really do anything, whatever. But it, the engine didn't have any oomph, it wasn't fast, it was just eh. And then I drove the Paxton car, and it was fucking psychotic. And it was exactly what I had hoped that thing was. Um, and uh, did that car have power amazing. steering? Yes. The Paxton car? Mm-hmm. Was it like just dramatically over-assisted and no, very yeah. light? Okay. Yeah, I, that's one of the things that really I don't like about those cars when, with power steering. There's a lot of dead spot. I mean, the steering is, I would consider it unacceptable in a truck, frankly. Like, it's so over it's so light, it's so vague. There's so Part much, the like, pointless, like, useless. Yeah, but if you drive, like, a 65, um, th- then, like, it's not like that. It has mm. genuinely, like, good a 65, steering. A 65, it's a GT350. Yes, correct. Right, totally different kind of car. Yes, that has genuinely good steering. Um, uh, Corvette Stingrays, uh, mm-hmm. C2 generation, are the same way. Actually, they all have kind of really low geared steering. That's just like, my God, could right. you please hook up the, the steering? But a, a C2 was on my list of things that were ruined um, because it was Stingray. It was gorgeous. It had the little engine. Rev happy. Best shifter I've ever felt in my life. Better than a Miata, better than a Suzuki. They have very good shifter. shifters. I will give them that. The steering is, is really the thing I don't like. And about the suspension. Cars. I don't know what the fuck was happening at the back of that car, but it, on a straight road, it wanted to go every direction but straight, and it was scary. Genuinely yeah. bad, and they're all like that, apparently. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I think tires matter a lot. Mm-hmm. The, a lot of the ones I've driven like are, that are show cars are on like the bias ply tires. That's and so the, there's just this tendency for the car to kind of go wherever it pleases. Well, there was, all a, of this, there was like, a total sort of... disconnect from the front to the back. You turn, you know, first of all, it had this much play, like 90 degrees of play. Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of, you turn in and the front would take a set. And then at some point in the next two weeks, the rear would decide to do whatever it was it was going to do. And it had nothing to do with the front. It was, it was, it was just one of the worst driving cars I've ever been in, period. Gorgeous. God, but... The motors, the motor and gearbox is wonderful. And you should drive a big block at some point because the big block has this thing where when you rev the car and the whole car rocks, especially if you have one with side pipes, Mm -hmm. it is, it's, I mean, it's kind of like a, you could also get that experience in a Cobra and it's obviously, but Cobra is a much better driving experience. But yeah, but even with a small motor that it was just, it made all this power up top. It was beautiful. It revved, it sang, it did everything. And the shifter was great, but I, my God. 
Mm. Yes, they didn't. They they didn't know much about chassis development at that time. It was Detroit. Detroit. There were no road. There were curves. There were no curves. All the roads there are straight. Mm-hmm. What else? Are you um, well, actually, I just started talking about the Cobra. I think Cobras are great. They are really hard riding. Really, really hard riding. And also, the, hold on. Which the, list is it on, though? Uh, it's it's in the do meet. On the do, okay. Like all of the things that I just described about liking about the Corvette, I would say the Cobra, ha- in terms of like just the raucous, um, big American V8 noises and just this rawness that it, like you we love about old cars. Like it has all of that. It has a, a a nice chassis, and you know we talked about the origin of the Cobra and how it was based on the AC. Uh, and those ACs are really wonderful, gratifying drivers' cars, also. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the the Cobra, I would say, meet. It's just the the suspension is really uncivilized, and uh, the heat management is really poor. Yeah, like they like the, in the Cobra driving. rallies, they get, they'll be driving through the Rockies, and the guys will have parkas, and it'll be snowing because Cobra guys are insane like that. And then they'll be wearing like Birkenstocks and shorts on their lower half because the bottom mm-hmm. half of them gets cooked while the top half is in a parka. Like yeah. that's it, they're really really like bad at heat management which sounds like a weird nit to pick until you like actually until you experience a car like yeah. this and you're like i can't I, I want to not be in this car because Kuntash. i fear for my life kuntashas are like that too yeah you think you're gonna get burnt to death and it's 38 um, degrees outside yes and the window opens this far that literally much, yeah. this yeah. far yeah. um uh I, I would still i still very much would like to own a kuntash but it's a deeply flawed car i think even more flawed than the mira oh, yeah. um oh yeah in terms of a like usability standpoint, uh, what else? 300 SL. I think it's no secret we both love the 300 SL. That's in a do meet category for sure, so especially if you compare to other 50s cars. I went through my uh, my notes on that, and I wrote a 12 inch dildo of a motor strapped onto an over the top chassis. <laughs> <laughs> and I made myself laugh when I read that. Like, all of the notes were about this ridiculously pornographic engine. I think that's the best description I can give that car. Um, the motor is just overwhelmingly huh. the best part of that car. And the chassis is good, and the way it looks is great, but it was all about that engine. Totally um, in my do meet this car I, category. So to, to the comments on the 300SL, I would add, I think... You know, just like I was complaining about the turbo, the Porsche turbo and how it made going fast like too easy and too Mm -hmm. boring. I think the 300 SL actually kind of, well, by 1950 standards, it was the it was the fastest car in the world. It was the McLaren F1 of its day, really sophisticated, like much faster than anything else. And so that the, the, the thing is that 1950s cars are so bad and so slow by and large that the what the 300 SL does of making it go easier to go faster is actually a good thing because now you're going about as fast as modern traffic right. uh, and so you can drive the car even though it's from the 1950s and most 1950s cars are not usable you can drive the car in, mo- in modern traffic and you can hustle it in a way that is like gratifying and it doesn't feel outdated today which most 50s and obviously earlier cars do and so I think that that car exists at exactly the right spot where when you make the car more competent, it's a good thing instead of a bad thing. I was going to say there uh, was an inflection point somewhere around the five second to, to 60 mark. You know, yeah, I think it probably happened in the 70s or 80s mm-hmm. is, is what I would argue, yeah. um, depending on the performance became, level of the car. Yeah, and to be clear, you know, what we mean is that there's a point at which we didn't want more progress was actually hurting the experience. Yes, because it made the experience less Easy. interesting and more sort of just uh, inert, anesthetized. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so the, the 300 SL, the chassis competence, other than the at the limit handling, which is apparently quite scary. Um, but there's like, a, uh, the other thing that's nice about that car is there's this durability to it. I mean, classic Mercedes Benz like experience where you're just like, I could just cane this car and drive it as hard as I possibly could and it would be okay with it which a lot of like vintage cars, you're like, oh, I have to be very gentle with it. I'm going to break it. Something yeah, is going to go wrong. Not, not in that Mercedes. That Mercedes is like, drive, drive it flat out for a thousand miles and it'll be fine. Uh, and in a vintage car, that's a really liberating experience because you don't realize how mentally fatiguing or like emotionally fatiguing it is to be like, oh God, are we going to make it? Like what, what's going to break? Like what am I going to do wrong? Oh, yeah, that'd be, that'll and, be job. That and, really and, trip, that stress. Yeah, and a lot of Italian cars are like that. And the 300 SL, you're just like, it'll be fine. Uh, and there's this sort of freeingness to it um, that where you're like, I don't have to worry about the car 
like it's going to be fine and I can do whatever I want to it and you don't have to treat it in any particular special way. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate the 300 SL for, for that as well. So I think yeah. vintage Porsches are generally pretty good about that mm -hmm. also. Um, mm -hmm. Like 356s, 911, no. Vintage, okay. vintage, carburetor. 928 is a 40 year old car, almost That's 50. not vintage. Oh. It's newfangled. <laughs> that car is newfangled. It has. It's got fuel injection. It's, it's newfangled. Got, it has, yes, that's right. It has fuel injection and, and a timing belt. An it's electronic not. speedometer. How yeah. could they? <laughs> Precisely. Uh, uh, I'm talking about like 356s. 356s, yeah. I would say, if, so if you've driven a 356 or spent time with one, like it, there, there's this sort of durableness to those cars it's where you're like, I want to drive it hard and I'm not worried about it. Yeah, it's like a Volkswagen um, Beetle. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. What do you have? I don't have much else. I have Z BMW Z8. Yes. I like that. It was on the, it was on the, wow, I can't believe this thing drives as good as it looks. Let's... Yes. It looks great. It drives great. It feels like, a, I mean, it's, a, it is the vintage sports car formula rendered with, you know, an S62 and a mm -hmm. six speed manual and all that good stuff. Yep. I would say it's a little... I don't know, it's just a little too modern for me, but I, overall, I, I was very impressed by the car. I like the way that it works, and I think, like, given what was in the realm of possible outcomes when that car came out in 2000 or 1999, I think they, that it is yeah. as exciting and thrilling as a car could legally be and still be sold, other than, I guess, like a Lotus Elise or a... Which is also on my list. Um, as a... As a, you want to meet that hero. Hmm. Why, you don't agree? Um, no, it's a great experience. I would definitely do it. Uh, I wouldn't own one. Why not? It's exactly the opposite of what I just described about the Gullwing, which is this sort of impression of like durableness and ability to mm. beat on it and like perceived quality. Like for me, there's just too much sort of like plasticky, garbagey, rattly, like abusiveness to the to yeah. Lotus that the perceived quality feels lower than it is. Uh, I assume. I can't imagine that it actually is. The interesting as... thing about the car is it feels like it's going to fall apart because the in, the body is glued and bolted with a bunch of shims to the chassis and it makes all of these terrible clicking and popping and clanging noises. And they did, the press cars did this when they were new. This is how I know that mine, you know, at 10 years old is, is just exactly the way it was designed. They make all the worst noise in the world, but mechanically... They're stout as fuck. Yeah. I mean, you know, Toyota engine transmission. I get and that. And then really solidly engineered suspension, whatever. They don't break. The new ones don't. I guess also I have a hard time divorcing it from the old Lotuses. Like old Lotuses, they had like these oh, rubber yeah. ball joint things where they would go, like the rear suspension would be designed like this and the rubber thing would just pop out. Yeah. Like there was, they were really right. crappy. Yeah. The old ones. No, at least are nothing like that. The, the mechanicals of it are really good. It's just slam the door and you're going to break a, a, a window or lean on the windshield yeah. and you're going to slap the you know, I, I just that. It, it, I think it's too much PTSD for my associations mm -hmm. with vintage mm -hmm. Lotuses that like it's not a welcome positive experience for me yeah. to have all of that that unwelcome sort of perceived low quality stuff for I mean me you do personally. have a Mercedes 500e so we were gonna we were gonna well yes to. and I just was extolling the virtues of a, a 300 SL right. so which is a very durable car mm -hmm. um the uh, the last one, which is going to be indulgent because nobody cares about these cars but me, but um, the R-Type Continental Bentley, like early 1950s. Uh, How is that a hero car to anyone other than you? It's one of... That's what I was saying. I told you it was going to be <laughs> indulgent. Okay, if you look it's at the value... a hero car that's an old man car. Look at the values of these cars and you will see that I'm not alone in feeling like Are this. There? Oh, they're not worth nothing like all the 60s and 70s and 80s cars? They're, they're worth like a million and a half dollars. Oh, okay. Um, and the, the car was like a technological tour de force when it came out. It was, the car was so high performing that they had to develop, a, like the Veyron, they had to develop a special tire for the car that could withstand the performance that the car was capable of generating. Mm -hmm. I think that tells you a lot about the car. Anytime that tire technology is not in the same place that the car is and they have to develop a new tire for a car, it, it's telling. So, I mean, part of it was because the car was so damn heavy. Um, it, was, it was heavy and... You could say the same thing about the 140S class that needed to have tires developed for it. 
but yeah, but that's a that's a like sophisticated like okay, like okay. they they pushed the envelope in some way in, that the rest of the industry had not caught up with because no one else had made a car that made that had made the same demands of the tire. In any case, uh, it's a it's a high performance car that was also comfortable and well finished and luxurious and it had good road holding and like go 120 miles an hour all day long and like in almost complete silence. But there's this sort of intoxicating experience about these cars, this sort of quality of both engineering and craftsmanship. I also think they're just achingly gorgeous, which helps. I mean, this just wonderful aesthetic experience, like attention to aerodynamics in the late 1940s, which was always kind of like telling. Uh, but they just have this sensation of like driving the finest car in the world kind of feeling when you drive that car. And not just like from a quality, like luxuriousness, but from like a sporting sense. And so in that sense, I guess it's kind of like the 1970s Aston V8 Vantage where they're like, yes, you would like to have one of the highest performing cars in the world, but it, you don't need to be like you're in a Countach where you're like, I'm going to die of heat stroke and <laughs> my, I, my, I have a crook in my neck because my head is touching the ceiling. And like also like I can't feel my arms and legs because the, the control efforts are so high. And I think it's harder to make a high performing car that is sort of, uh, that doesn't make those kinds of like insane demands of the driver, especially back then. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think it's all the more remarkable. Anyway, I think our type Continentals are wonderful cars. Nobody else cares, but you would. So it's very interesting me. that your last pick was the Bentley R Type Continental, and my last pick is every hot hatch ever. <laughs> Because I've never driven a two of five two from a two of five GT GTI to a Mark One to a Ford Focus. I have never driven a hot hatch that failed to live up to its amazingness. I think a lot of that also is that those cars face an uphill battle because everyone is always dismissing them, and so for them to come at it, people are like, "Oh, it's a front wheel drive." Oh, like, you collect your snooty snob. The, you people were dismissing it. The rest of us were fantasizing about, oh my God, I want a GTI, or oh my God, I want, a, like, a, can you imagine like a 205 GTI? 65? Like, there were so many awesome hot hatches that I fantasized about that the, the funny thing is, you say that people were dismissing them, but when I, like, when you walked around Europe, anyone that had a 959 in their garage drove a GTI every day. They all drove hot hatches. So I, I don't know, it's funny that we just come from... Well, I guess what I'm difference. saying is that the form factor of the car does not inspire lust the way that other like exotic form factors do. And so the cars necessarily have to be really like driver oriented sure. and really like deliver on experience because it can't rely on like a 308. It can't rely it's on its pinion for good mm -hmm. looks. It has to be actually like a genuinely good driving well, experience. GTI relied on its Jajaro good looks, the first one, Mark 1. But not the U.S. one, so it doesn't Yeah, you know what I'm okay. saying. Like, it, I know what it, you mean. It's You're a form right. factor that puts it on a bedroom it wall it, of 90% of children. It's not going it, to pull the 308 stunt, which is looking unbelievable and driving like shit. Because yeah. then it would just be a Dodge Omni or some other horrible hot hat or some, you know, cold hatch. So hatch. You're right. Hatch. Shit box. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I have to drive more. I don't have a lot of hatch experience. Mm. Uh, They're all great. Hot They're or otherwise. Great. Uh, I mean, your your bitch basket uh, is is certainly opened my eyes to the possibility that that experience could happen. Uh, what other? I mean, so I went through the SCCA school in an Integra, and so I was like, I'm going through in a front wheel drive car. But then, like driving the car on track and going through school in it, I was like, okay, never mind. This is yeah. spectacular. And so that that experience. I mean, I was 18 when I did that, so I hadn't been driving for very long. But I sort of was biased against front wheel drive for my first car. I was like, I really want a rear wheel drive car for my first car. It's the same sort of opening, eye opening experience of a Miata. When you tell, tell somebody to drive a Miata and they've only driven serious sports cars forever. And they, they first thing they do after driving the Miata is buy one because, you know. Yeah, because they're like, how can this experience cost so little money? Right. And that's, that was the same with hot hatches, including CRXs and Integras and all, you know, all the sort of great era Honda stuff. Um, that it's funny. I, and I haven't driven like hardly any of them. I've never driven, I think other than that Integra, I don't think I've ever driven a front wheel drive like a Honda, hot Honda. I have a, or like, uh, I have a Civic SI hatch, uh, a sedan as a press car right now. If we were in social distancing, I would let you drive it. Ah, uh, but that's too modern. Doesn't it have to be like the sort of like 80s, 90s stuff? Yeah, I'm kidding. It's not to, to get And like I would love to, and the Delta Integrale, but that's four-wheel drive. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah I, Integra Type R, which I've also yes. never driven. Yes. That I would love to drive. I mean, when I see how expensive they are, I, my read is like, wow, those things must be spectacular mm -hmm. to drive because they're awfully expensive. 
still considered the best handling front wheel drive car. Yeah, Sold so in the US, I have so. to experience that. Meanwhile, instead, I'm, I'm blathering. You're going to have your Bentley. Bentley. Yeah, you're going to have your Bentley. All right. On that note, I'm out of things to discuss. I think we're going to say meet your heroes because you have to decide for yourself. Yes, but try and drive as much other shit as possible from that period so that you can put it in context. I think it's a mistake to try and judge things. Uh, and that was something that happened after years where you finally have enough pieces of the puzzle to see like the whole picture uh, instead of uh, getting something in isolation and being like, well, this thing isn't that impressive. But then you think about like you compare it to other cars from the same period you've driven. I'm going to say the opposite. I had no... Even when I didn't have any experience of stuff for this, from the 60s, um, like the first couple things I drove, Mazda Cosmo was one of the first 60s Japanese or one of the first 60s sports cars that I've driven. And it, right off the bat, I'm like, this is fun. It's different. It's, you know, it's, I had no idea what, how to compare it to, you know, a, a 60s 911 at the time, but I knew good when I felt it. Um, I just, I think something, well, I don't know. Like, I feel this way about the Jaguar XK. The Jaguar XK, like, is kind of bad in some ways, but if you think about what else you could experience at the time, then you're like, holy hell. I have to think about. I want to think of things about, I want to draw something that, that is good, good, period. I don't want to have to then say, I well, it's good I, considering. I don't think you're going to be a, an XK120 customer. That's why, personally, actually, that's why I would buy an E-Type and not an XK120. Well, E-Type was, um, that was, we, I skipped over it because this episode is now an hour and 16 minutes long. Um, but I skipped over, E-Type was one of them on my list. Like, holy shit, that car is epic to drive. Um, and I don't think there needs to, there should be a little asterisk that says for its time or compared to yeah, this. Yeah, but if you go in expecting it, if you go in expecting it to behave like a, I don't know, a... a yeah, I'll go in expecting it to be something that puts a smile on your face. An E36 M3. Like, because you're like, okay, they're both front wheel, they're front, both front engines, inline six rear wheel drive, naturally aspirated with manual transmissions. And your benchmark is an E36 M3. And then you drive an E-Type, you're like, wow, this is terrible. You have to understand that technology has come a long way. I think yeah. you have baked but into it, your uh, baked, baked into your driving assumptions is that like, wow, this shit's old. It's gonna suck. I guess. I mean, but I'm I'm also just thinking like, what's the experience like on operating the clutch? How does the engine respond? How does the engine sound? What does the steering feel like? And if you go into it with that, I've noticed you, not- you notably like. left out brakes. Mm. You notably mm. left out brakes. Your brakes are always bad. <laughs> brakes didn't yes. get good until the eighties. <laughs> yes, correct. Okay, we're wrapping up now. Right, I'm going to um, go back to work and do my normal stuff. Leave you, leave you here to curmudgeon on your own. Okay. Story of my life. Sorry about this. Just put that right over there.